Good evening. Thank you, Fermin, for this uh, introduction and for inviting me here in the first place and challenging me with your very unusual format. Let's see. And for offering me some wine to get into the idea of not talking about the conventional things we talk about when we are with architects. Um, I've called it life at work because of its two meanings. I hope you get both the meanings. Um, it, it is, uh, I prefer one of the meanings. It's, uh, it's about life being central in architecture. Without life, there would have been no architecture. We are only there because we need to support life um, with the facilities for it to go on. And the one meaning is about, you know, how, we, how our life is when we are at work. But for me, the more important meaning is life itself at work. You know, it's life is the generator and the driver of everything. And staying alive means to be creative, to be um, spontaneous, to, be, to, to remain young, to not be afraid, to take risks and all of that. I hope to share with you a little bit, a little insight into um, what um, is behind my professional life. I grew up in India, like he explained, uh, and you know, I studied, when I studied architecture, there was nobody I knew who was an architect. I had nobody in the family or in my friend's circle, so I didn't clearly know what architecture was, and I associated architecture more as something that is in the backdrop and life happening in the foreground, except for the famous monuments like the Taj Mahal and uh, you know iconic uh, buildings which have their place. In India, architecture is often observed like that. There's a lot of crafting, there's geometry, there's territory, there's infrastructure. This is the step 12s that you see everywhere where it was not a banal expression of how you extract water out of the well, you know, but it didn't look like the infrastructure looks now in our cities, but it was, infrastructure was celebrated because water is, to, is the source of life and that's the backdrop they made for life to go on. And I still believe in that meaning of architecture, I have to say, that I believe life is in the foreground and architecture must not compete with life and it should be its places in the background and we have to facilitate spaces for providing a better life. This was my daily life in Bombay. I was one of those people trying to get out of the train if you manage to get into the train in the first place. You know, in India we are um, one-sixth of the world's population and um, we have only 2.4% of the world's land. So we have to cut the cake very slim, you know? We don't have s the same resources, and our mod we are struggling with urbanization, and especially when we follow Western models or when people from other developed countries practice there, they don't realize the degree of uh, resource crunch. And, um, on the other hand, I also grew up, you know, Bombay is a mega city, so a lot of the one-sixth of the population I talked about live actually in Bombay and a few places. The rest of India is still not urban. But in the not so urban places that uh, I used to observe around me, um, and that has influenced my work a lot, is this kind of a, a three layers of three different urban forms that you see in every city. You have the, in the peripheries, uh, because they are still free from regulations to some extent, because the cities are expanding into those areas where they haven't prepared the ground for a city. And you see the middle skyline, where there is a random growth and natural expansion of people adding a floor, uh, spreading sideways, very random, very haphazard, and very organic. But then there are the developer-driven planned developments that are trying to absorb the migration from rural to urban, but also globalization-related uh, drivers that, that create, uh, you know, the, the, when Europe urbanized, 
everything was happening at a much slower pace and you had the time to put in the infrastructure and so on and we don't have that kind of thing. So as a result, what happens is that those, the skyline at the back, which is equally worrying, generates actually the informal settlements because they create jobs and people move here and the notion of urban poverty which means that people who have jobs and work more than eight or ten hours a day do not afford housing. So this is the kind of things that I used to watch every day when I went into the train and watch these cities sprouting overnight. China is also one-sixth of the world's population, so we are already alone, these two countries are one-third. So we, cannot, we need a very radical way to rethink everything. So by the time I graduated, I was already worried about this kind of social segregation that is actually created in the way we are, by uh, transporting Western models of urbanization into a context that is not yet industrialized. So the industrial model, the post-industrial urbanism is, taking, is being taken to Africa, South America, everywhere without having undergone that urbanization, it's, uh, the, the industrialization itself. And the, all the problems originate from these experiences. And finally, even though I, as I explained that I believe architecture lies in the f background, and it's the spatial experience that we actually m are meant to design, I started taking a much more keen interest in material research, not because I believe obsessively in the material aspect of architecture, but because the contemporary architecture is associated with a very problematic materiality. The, never before have we created this kind of environmental problem, and despite all the technological advances, the per capita consumption of resources continue to be on the rise. So many more people are in need of development and housing, but the housing is going to be of a much higher standard because that's the trend. And therefore, we are not going to, we are falling short. So these are the type of thoughts which were going through my mind and I didn't know, I didn't want to work with typical practices and like here you see what I did. I dropped out of Bombay and I needed time to think. I didn't want to just work just because I wanted a job. I realized that my main resource is my life, is my time and I don't want to waste it. And I need to have the time to think for myself, not, I was, I was paying for my life from a quite early age, and I'm so happy that I, was, I, I wasn't overprotected in my family. I've always lived outside the comfort zone, and I'm more comfortable um, outside of that comfort zone, actually, by now. Um, because all the false assurances and all those lazy habits that come from social convention, etc. I th felt you need to drop it, the sooner the better. And I moved, I built this house, it must have cost at that time uh, just about, uh, I don't know, 100 euros or something. Uh, I wanted my own life to be affordable so that I could liberate myself from, liberate my time, uh, not make my own, you know, just to pay my bills, do any shitty jobs and all that, you know, and just not have time to think. So I wanted to take the time. So I moved uh, to a, a place called Oroville where there was a future city planned, but there was a very organic life happening already on the ground. It was an international city. I have to explain the nature of my adventures because uh, I didn't know how to drive a motorbike. I needed a motorbike to survive in the middle of nowhere. I, it was like in a reforested area in the middle of nowhere, snakes would fall from the ceiling. It was like a jungle book life for me, honestly. And this, which I built that place, I thought it, you know, I was a city girl, I didn't know, I was growing vegetables, everything inefficiently, just doing anything, you know, uh, and discovering. And I realized that um, it was a phase in my life that was very important because th this house, which I didn't expect to last, I landed up living there for 10 years. It could have gone on. I, I had this motorbike, I used to go and explore, but most, and f most of all, and by the way, I had already started my practice at the age of 23. When I built that home, I also, I wanted to take time out, but I also wanted to have a practice. So I did both and it somehow worked for me. 
And, but I, what I salvaged through a simple life and liberating myself, I wanted to be liberated from having possessions, for, from having to do too many unnecessary things. I wanted to di discriminate between what is superfluous, what is redundant, what is valuable and precious to spend my time on. And this time that I still try to have to do nothing is the most important time because if you don't have the time to do nothing, you don't know what you're doing for the rest of the day. So I, I think that was one of the sensiblest decisions. And to just explain what went into that bohemian life, hippie life, whatever. I was living basically in a com community with a few huts with these two guys. Both are by chance in Berlin. I hope they are not here. <laughs> or both are architects. Both are called Peter. <laughs> One, I just realized, Peter in the front was from Vienna. Uh, he, he studied, uh, they were all very intellectual about, he studied with the deconstructivism period. The one behind studied with Ungers from TU Berlin. And all of us were talking late into the nights about everything, you know. And doing a balance, you know, like for instance, this elephant coming to our, it is in our, around our house. I mean, just the idea to even have an elephant from the Pondicherry temple to come. And we've done all kinds of things. I just want to say that was not hap That is, once you take step out, everything happens again. You know, and that's what I did a lot of. I still do a lot of. So inside all these kind of very urban rat race kind of thing, there was also moments, and actually most of India is, that the jungle book aspect exists, you know. I mean, it's, it's not like every India is full of snake charmers and all that. But there is an untamed, un, you know, not controlled by human thing, which you can interact with. And I was, I was, uh, I took all these experiences. So look how empty those areas were. Roads were not paved. I used to go out with motorbikes. I started exploring the region. And I started discovering you know, it's like a movie or a storybook when children, you read it again and again, you start to see more because there's nothing happening really. You know it by heart, but then you see more and more and more. So it's like a movie you're repeating. So when I would go into my rural area around me where there was apparently nothing, I started reflecting deeply about all these things like the way the, uh, the pre-industrial bricks are made and continue to be made, how the, the casuarina is grown, um, in that local area, it's the reforestation happens in the time when they're not rice farming, and how building material manufacture is deeply rooted in territory. You know, whether it is a modern material that requires a kiln to be made with lots of coal, it's still a physical thing. It exists in a physical place, and it, it's very, it affects a lot of things. I started discovering how human society and the people whose livelihoods are connected with the making of raw materials like lime you know and gen you know some c people who are doing this for f that's all they do and if you without knowing it you come and prescribe portland cement because that's what was taught to us by the british system we would be derailing that entire society without even being aware and not knowing, on the other hand, how strong lime is and how be benign that is and so on. So I had the time to discover, discover and critically examine materials in the, their relationship to the territory and in, with the human beings who are involved with the making of those raw materials. Because I used to only see the part that the people who work on site and not if you go down to the origin of materials. And, that's all the discoveries I made. People are still hand extracting granite in India, um, like in the age old way, in, in territories. They live, the villages are located here. They have incredible skills that we used to look at them as imperfections as per, because of the way we were taught and so on. So these type of discoveries, you know, I found a picture of myself also from, you can see that I had 23 years old. I just started my office. I was discovering those potters. I, you know, you, I, you can see all that I don't know in my look there. But it did not, I realized what you do not know doesn't have to interfere with what you do know. You know, and that was a very important discovery for me because that's, if you are going to fear 
that threshold, then we will just remain in the safe zone and we will, there will be no innovation. Those type of thoughts made me, led to me uh, developing, you know, I saw that the artisans were trying to sell cooking pots that nobody's going to buy, but they were mechanically sitting there habitually trying to sell them. And I used to think instead of urbanization robbing their jobs, threatening their livelihood, if I could find a way to redirect it and build elements for roofing systems, etc., based on engineering, then they could guarantee their livelihoods. And in India, with all these crowds of people, we have the human resource, and that would save energy. That was a very basic thinking. And I was trying to figure out, you know, how to build the first project that I got for a Frenchman um, when I was I started my office with that. And uh, I had only told him, please, you can he used to uh, try to influence me because, you know, he thought he's doing me a favor by giving me a job. They always do that in the beginning. But I told him, okay, do whatever, but don't change my roofing system. Because that, I want to get one thing, you know, which you, so we made a deal. And, you know, this is a system, that uh, catenary curve with which I began to start dealing with, uh, I was scared, I skipped too quickly, I was scared Fermin will tell me I'm talking about architecture. But um, actually, I want to talk about the experimentation. I want to talk about the human beings and what I mean about the life at work and ensuring these lives and seeing technologies not delinked from the humans who actually are involved in the technologies and how it can socially all make sense. So um, I was trying to bring the social, economic, and green issues together, basically and create a contemporary architecture that I could relate. So I'm showing this to explain that I eventually, after 10 years, landed up making a house for myself. This is my own house, which, uh, which was full of experimentation because I could do here what I couldn't do at the client's cost or making them as guinea pigs to test things. But when I had got used to that free life, you know, that I was in the hut life, actually, resulted in a house I made that was so open, so generous, that eventually I realized that all the animals were flying through, I mean, birds were going through, animals were fitting in, dogs had colonized my place from the whole area. I had to put up those shutters for, for at least having some time for me as well in the house. But what was most astonishing is this. My, my mother was paralyzed. I was taking care of her, so I made everything to be hand, like, uh, easy to look after my mother on a wheelchair. But uh, she used, she, uh, the neighbor had a horse, and the horse used to come to have the, she, she used to get carrot juice every morning, and all the crumbs of the carrot used to go to the horse. With my friend used to come for breakfast. There was an ecosystem there, a little one. And the horse, I was astonished would come straight into the house. It was very odd. And I felt, oh, wow, it's not only in the human scale, but also animals are feeling free about it to just enter. It's not easy to pull the horse in. These were amazing memories. And I had a further picture of me going with the horse in the sea with the same horse. I, I'm also not, a, just like bikes, I also haven't any experience with horses. But I did all that, that I was um, not, um, I mean, I think it's, it's okay to be open-minded and just do things that you've never done before. I think that's the part that makes you feel alive. And uh, so in conclusion, what I would say is uh, referring to this sketch of, uh, that I sent to uh, Aravena when we did the 20, 2016 Venice Biennale, when he asked us to show our work, it was 25 years of my practice, and so I wanted to consolidate and, uh, my archive and explain something. So I tried to explain that the projects that the media writes about and people cover are just like the fruits of an enormous tree, and what we should be talking about is what is in the underground, which we don't get to see. And that's what I showed in Venice. I want to also um, mention it was called building knowledge, building community, because I felt the need of the hour is to have the courage to build the knowledge through each and every architectural project to actually build new knowledge so that we can build appropriately to the environmental context, to the social imbalances and affordability issues that our current way of building 
is creating almost sometimes more problems than they solve. So I wanted to highlight the knowledge that is behind the projects and to express the tree, the tree trunk as the process of architecture which, is, which allows, uh, teaches us to synthesize very diverse things that seem to be unrelated, the climate, the human scale, uh, whatever. We, we research technologies, aesthetics, and the trunk synthesizes it automatically because it's in the DNA to do so. And the, the projects are just a, a variety of expressions according to the context. And I try to explain that the battle, which because he talked about reporting from the front, the battle happens actually in the root tips where you are pushing for new ground, where the frontiers lie. And, um, you know, paving the way, life force, exploring, going into the matter deeply, and the fruits are an effect, affected by that, what the roots found. So, this is what uh, I would like to say, building knowledge is the most important thing, but Denken is interessanter als Wissen, aber nicht als Anschauen. So observation is also very important. And from the Black Mountain College and the Bauhaus, which are for me the most inspirational ex experimental movements, this is a Buckminster Fuller, it's from one of their YouTube videos, uh, where it, it explains actually the role of observation and action. So this is what I take forward to my students to allow them to have full-scale, one-to-one experimentation, uh, confronting reality through real people, real materials, real scale, real places. And doing it in the studio uh, itself, not just doing con concept after concept and getting more and more alienated in academia from life itself. These are things they are doing with books. We've made sofas there one or two days of just touching the matter, doing, entering the technology, you know, this is a watchtower uh, in a botanical garden made by the students of the AA when I was teaching there. Always there are craftsmen with them because we don't want them to be limited by only what they know how to make. So textile research going on, machines in the studio, artisans coming to the studio. And even for their events, you know, making constructions uh, with whatever means that they, they have. So um, here you see, you know, this was presented when we went to the Venice Biennale in 2012 with uh, under Chipperfield's invitation. Students were able to build a full-scale uh, project where they could work alongside interdisciplinary interaction with uh, craftsmen, engineers and others. And in the 2016 one, we, just to explain the importance given to knowledge, we are not just showing usually past works in exhibitions. We use those budgets to develop, this is called Fulfill Homes, where we used the exhibition budget actually to do a workshop with Mike Schleich here in TU Berlin to generate new materiality in the ferro cement to make the exhibition itself facilitate the new knowledge and to get a confirmation by testing some of those elements. So even though it was located in Venice, this was happening in Berlin, to, to develop this new knowledge that is required and that gives us back after doing projects. So we are basically chasing knowledge, but in the way we are building all those things, like in the case of the Venice Biennale, we had produced the rest of the pavilion by recycling the material of the Art Biennale from the German pavilion. And we, the students who went along with us to build it actually dealt with the affordability issues in Marghera area and finally were able to contribute after we, these are the things that people won't see in exhibitions, but after the exhibition was dismantled, we went back with students and we took all that material and we added to the refugee homes that are in the periphery of Venice. Um, and this is where you see the refugees. Uh, they've, they've just, with the students of Venice, have totally reassembled all those units in a very new way. So I um, end with that slide to explain that uh, how much ever we specialize in our professions, uh, you know, we, we are, I mean, not to forget life itself that for which our profession exists. Thank you. <laughs>